Nick Gordon. Nick Gordon is a doctor of politics and government at Ben Gurion University of the Negev and currently a member at the Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton. He writes on issues relating to the Israeli Palestinian conflict and human rights, including his book, Israel's Occupation. A third generation Israeli, he did his military service and was greatly wounded in action. During the First Intifada, he served as director of Physicians for Human Rights Israel. He and his wife, Tessan Rottenberg, founded the bilingual Arab Jewish Hagar School in Beersheba, where Hebrew and Arabic, Arabic are awarded equal status. Uh, status here. I have left an um, audio about this uh, in the lobby too. I took it from the internet and I think we'll be, uh, people should read about that. I think it's very important. So today this talk is called uh, Human Rights a Security Threat. Lawfare, lawfare and the Assault on Rights Work in Israel, Palestine. Please welcome Nick Gordon. So I'd like to thank um, Mikaela for organizing the event, the Christian Society for Israelites, as well as the different hosts uh, from uh, University. Um, I came to the Institute this year thinking of a project that deals primarily with political economy, but with a question that kind of spurred my uh, curiosity was that I had a sense that Israel's occupation of the West Bank, Gaza Strip, and East Jerusalem was in a way colonizing Israel, so that, so that there was a kind of backward move from a kind of colonial project in, in the territories and the, the forms of management that were uh, produced and uh, introduced in the occupied territories were slowly, uh, how would I say, penetrating, uh, colonizing Israel itself. But as it turns out, this is not what I've been working on. Uh, but it is, in a sense, there is an indication of this in this article. My, my project this year, which this will be part of a chapter of this project, we tentatively call it the human right to colonize. And it's about how human rights are appropriated by neoconservative groups and how they are inverted and the strategies developed by organizations ranging from Amnesty International Human Rights Watch or Israeli-Palestinian organizations like Betzelem and Akhat are mirrored by neoconservative groups and deployed in order uh, to justify dispossession, uh, killings, and so forth. So this what I'm going to present here today is actually a part of both those projects. Uh, it will be part of a chapter. Uh, and it's kind of limited in scope in terms of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which I assume uh, many of the people here are interested in. So I'm saying all this just to say that in the Q&A, if you're interested in asking me broader questions that are not necessarily related uh, to, the, to the talk today, I'll be happy to answer them as well. And uh, with this, I'll begin. A major campaign against universal human rights has, in, has been underway for the past decade. If once anti-human rights proclamations tended to come from authoritarian regimes worried about domestic and international legitimacy, currently new conservative forces within liberal democracies are at the forefront of an assault on human rights. This new campaign is not against human rights per se, but against a certain deployment of human rights aimed at curbing practices <coughs> emanating from the war on terrorism. It is part of a backlash against the mounting success of human rights organizations and cause lawyers in subjecting conflict 
and warfare to legal analysis and oversight. The ultimate objective of the campaign is to alter the principles of distinction, proportionality, and military necessity that appear in different international and humanitarian and human rights laws and to undermine the institutions that enable the enforcement of these laws. In this paper, I discuss the term lawfare, a term that combines the words law and warfare, and is defined as the use of law for realizing a military objective. I show how lawfare is being mobilized by neoconservatives against the deployment of universal jurisdiction by individuals and groups that aim to curb practices initiated primarily by the United States and Israel in the so-called war on terror. The deployment of, of this term over the past decade has engendered a lively debate in the scholarly literature, primarily about lawfare's definition and its normative underpinnings, but I, by contrast, am interested less with what lawfare describes and more than what lawfare does. My claim is that lawfare operates as a kind of speech act that through constant repetition helps to materialize a set of effects, one being the securitization of human rights work so as to reconstitute the human rights field as a national security threat. The securitization Securitization is a kind of jargon term in political science. It means the act of making something a security issue. The securitization of human rights is carried out by different securitizing actors, academics, NGOs, think tanks, policymakers, and legislators. To mobilize media, shape public opinion, lobby legislators and policymakers, introduce new laws, pressure donors, and employ a variety of other methods to pave the way for exceptional intervention against human rights organizations. Their objective is to limit the scope and impact of human rights work. In the next few minutes, I use Israel as a case study both because it has become one of the countries in which international legal framework has been transformed into a so-called battleground, and because human rights organizations have, been play, have themselves played a central role in this fray. In many respects, my analysis builds on Clifford Bob's work on clashes of networks and his effort to put more emphasis on the role played by conservative groups in global politics. One of the more recent developments in human rights work involves the increasing number of suits filed against government officials and security personnel in courts that exercise universal jurisdiction. Universal jurisdiction is based on the notion that there are acts which are so universally appalling that states have an interest in exercising the jurisdiction to combat them. A basic principle informing universal jurisdiction is the extraterritoriality of international law. The idea that international law can be applied to alleged criminal acts that have occurred outside the state territory where it is being deliberated, even if the alleged violation has been perpetrated by a non-national, and even if the state's nationals have not been harmed. Acts that are subject to universal jurisdiction include extrajudicial executions, torture, enslavement, enforced disappearances, the use of indiscriminate weapons, collective punishment, intentional destruction of civilian infrastructure, and numerous other acts that constitute war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. A paradigmatic and early example of universal jurisdiction in domestic courts occurred in 1998 when Spain requested the United Kingdom that the United Kingdom extradite General Augusto Pinochet. Since then, hundreds of suits have been filed in countries as Belgium, France, the Netherlands, Spain, Switzerland, Turkey, New Zealand, Norway, and the United Kingdom, primarily against military personnel and government officials from Africa, Latin America, the former Yugoslavia, 
but also against officials from the United States and Israel. The newest critique of human rights arises precisely from the exercise of universal jurisdiction against US officials and Israeli officials. Critics claim that suits of this kind constitute a major obstacle to the forces of freedom waging a global war on terrorism. This is where lawfare enters the picture. As I showed below, lawfare has been used to securitize the rights organizations in order to hinder the production and dissemination of incriminating evidence used in trials. Building on the ideas of the Copenhagen School, I understand security to mean a specific field of practice constituted around issues relating to threats and, cha and, cha and challenges to state sovereignty by other states and non-state actors. The crucial point is that security is not an objective condition, but rather is constituted through speech acts, norms, and political context. Accordingly, security emerges through particular social processes that elevate an issue or a field above normal political logic, which is exemplified in the following phrase. If we do not tackle this problem, everything else will be irrelevant because we will not be here or we will not be free to handle it in our own way. Security thus frames the issue either as a special kind of politics or as above politics, which paves the way for ex exceptional intervention that may violate normal legal and social rules. My claim is that lawfare encodes the field of human rights and in this way frames human rights work as a security threat. Since the success of this process is contingent upon its ability to inform public discourse and become part of society's common sense, the accusation human rights is lawfare must constantly be repeated. The constant iteration of lawfare by a set of securitizing actors not only designates human rights work as a security threat and renders it acceptable by a significant audience, but also materializes the securitization process. It propels a specific set of actions aimed at obstructing human rights work. In my paper, I spend time discussing Israel's relation to human rights organizations in the occupied Palestinian territories following the 1967 war, showing how they had already been securitized. I maintain that over the past few years, the security discourse deployed initially to control and manage the rights NGOs in the occupied territories has penetrated into Israel's pre-1967 borders. But this diffusion has been mediated by new actors and informed by global political developments and is therefore different from the securitization that took place in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. The impetus for the securitizations of human rights in Israel has to do with the fact that the reports exposing Israeli violations not only harm the country's international reputation, but as mentioned, they have served as evidence in criminal lawsuits against prominent military government figures for alleged violations of international law. Spain's request to extradite Pinochet from the United States Kingdom became a model for action. In 2001, Ariel Sharon, Israeli foreign minister at the time, was indicted by a Belgian court for crimes against Palestinians in Sabra and Shatila in 1982. News reports have suggested that ever since then, hundreds of lawsuits have been submitted against Israeli politicians, high-ranking military officers, and heads of secret services in several countries. And while none of these suits has actually led to a conviction, the Israeli government has been increasingly alarmed by the trend and has advised former politicians and military officers to refrain from traveling to certain European countries. In addition, government officials alongside staff members from NGOs and think tanks have found that reports published by human rights NGOs are frequently cited in the incriminated evidence. This has led to a change of approach within Israel. 
Leading the campaign against human rights organizations is NGO Monitor, which aims, according to its website, to generate and distribute critical analysis and reports on the output of the domestic and international NGO community for the benefit of government policymakers, journalists, philanthropic organizations, and the general public. Founded in 2002 by political scientist Gerald Steinberg of Bar-Ilan University, NGO Monitor analyzes reports and press releases of local and international NGOs and investigates international donors that fund them. It purports to expose the distortions of human rights issues in the Arab-Israeli conflict and to end the practice used by certain self-declared humanitarian NGOs of exploiting the label universal human rights values to promote politically and ideologically motivated agendas. In other words, the attack is, is directed against a particular political application of human rights and questions the legitimacy of a certain vernacularization of human rights rather than rejecting human rights to the core. NGO Monitor was the first organization to couch its criticism of rights groups in security for months, claiming that these groups constitute a national security threat to Israel. This line of reasoning was articulated by Steinberg in an article entitled NGOs Make War on Israel. In this way, Steinberg <coughs> tapped into the post-9-11 neoconservative trend, neoconservative trend in the United States. Neoconservatives in the United States and Israel began employing the term lawfare to describe increasing use of universal jurisdiction over a decade ago, particularly after President Bush's declaration of the war on terrorism. In a 2001 conference paper presented at Harvard University's Carr Center for Human Rights Policy, Major General Charles Dunlap defined lawfare as a method of war where law is used as a means of realizing a military objective. The US administration was never enthusiastic about the application of universal jurisdiction, particularly when it is used to criticize US policies. But ever since the international law was deployed to check certain practices utilized in the global war on terrorism, the United States has adopted an oppositional stance. In 2002, for example, the U.S. opposed the Rome Statute that established the International Criminal Court as a permanent tri tribunal to persecute individuals for alleged war crimes. It also pressured Belgium to change its domestic laws so as to limit the use of universal jurisdiction. Despite this opposition, high-ranking officials and CIA agents were still being held accountable in absentia for addition practices in German and Italian national courts that exercise universal jurisdiction. And in addition is the idea of, let's say, kidnapping someone in Italy, transferring them to Syria, where the person can be interrogated and tortured. Hence, in 2005, a Pentagon document commissioned by Donald Rumsfeld and entitled The National Defense Strategy of the United States of America warned that our strength as a nation still will continue to be challenged by those who employ a strategy of the weak using international fora, judicial processes, and terrorism. The Bush administration thus associated legal threats with terrorism. This new doctrine appeared extremely germane to Israeli cops who picked up on the term lawfare and have been using it to securitize human rights organizations both in Israel and abroad. There was, as mentioned, fertile, fertile grounds for this move since Israel had already securitized Palestinian NGOs. NGO Monitor defines lawfare as a strategy of using or misusing law as a substitute for traditional military means to achieve a military objective. Leading the lawfare campaign against Israel are what the monitoring group calls NGO superpowers, by which it means Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, 
And these organizations, these superpowers, work in cooperation with Palestinian and Israeli rights groups. And together, they all exploit universal jurisdiction in pursue, in, in, to pursue litigation in European, North American, and uh, Israeli national courts. While these rights NGOs claim to be part of the fight for human rights, the evidence shows an NGO monitor's opinion that the core motivation for the activity is to promote lawfare in order to punish Israel for carrying out anti-terror operations. While the term lawfare is being used as a defamatory, in a defamatory way in order to describe and condemn the work of human rights NGOs, its reiteration helps to reconstitute the rights NGOs as a national security threat. In order to succeed, lawfare has to follow the grammar of security, which constructs a plot that includes, among other things, an existential threat. It does so by invoking the force of authority through the repetition or citation of prior and authoritative sets of practices or norms that are already familiar to the public. Moreover, for this discursive act to actually have an effect, it is not enough for it to appear in a couple of reports published by NGOs and think tanks. Rather, it has to inform public and the public imagination. Once the rationale informing the law, the informing lawfare discourse is widely accepted, it then becomes logical for Israel to adopt exceptional methods to obstruct the work of rights NGOs. We can now turn to briefly see how the logic of lawfare has operated in Israel and how its rationale has gained legitimacy and currently informs a series of proposed, proposed policies against human rights organizations. In the paper, I show how the lawfare logic actually made headway in the Israeli public sphere only after the UN fact-finding mission report about the 2008 2009 Gaza War, also known as the Goldstone Report. Uh, all, only after the report was published. I therefore offer a brief description of the rights related effects in the Gaza War, which for the sake of time I will have to skip here. The crucial issue from the vantage point of this paper is not so much the debate surrounding the accuracy of the Goldstone Report or the personal attacks against Judge Goldstone but rather that the report was constructed as part of the lawfare apparatus and thus as a national threat. Within hours of the report's publication, NGO Monitor issued a press release characterizing its 575 pages as an NGO cut and paste document. The claim was that a considerable amount of the report's findings were based on reports and testimonies provided by human rights NGOs. Joining NGO Monitor in this campaign was Intiutsu, if you will it, a grassroots organization that was established in 2006 in order to remove, in its words, Zionist discourse, Zionist thinking, and Zionist ideology to ensure the, to ensure the future of the Jewish nation and the, of the state of Israel. This initial criticism was followed by the publication of long briefs claiming that Israeli human rights organizations funded by the New Israel Fund, the single largest donor to Israeli human rights organizations, served as the building blocks of the Goldstone Report. Using elaborate graphs and colorful figures, Intiutsu calculated that 14% of the references in the report came from publications and testimonies of Israeli group, group, rights groups funded by the New Israel Fund. NGO Monitor blamed Israel's rights organizations for lobbying the government of the United States, the European Union, and other countries to legitimize the UN report and endorse its recommendations. Following the publication of these briefs, Intiutsu launched a public campaign against the New Israel Fund and Israeli human rights organizations. The campaign began with a magazine expose in the widely circulated Maori, whose title on the front page read, The Material from Which Goldstone is Made. 
followed by the subtitle, New Research Discloses How a Group of Israeli Leftist Organizations Were Active Partners in Drafting the Goldstone Report, which defamed the IDF and the state. During the same period, Intil Tzu posted large provocative, if not defamatory, billboard ads portraying the president of the New Israel Fund, former Knesset member Nomi Khazan, with a horn on The byline reads, Nomi Goldstone Khazan, Nomi Khazan's new fund stands behind the Goldstone Report. Now, horn in Hebrew is keren, and keren means fund and horn. And the horn on the head is also an anti-Semitic trope. So basically, the, the, the trope here is that uh, Nomi Khazan, which is the previous Knesset member, is anti-Semitic. And of course, Goldstone is anti-Semitic, and, and, and so forth. Uh, uh, the campaign proved, proved to be extremely successful. For several days, television and radio talk shows spent hours discussing whether or not the New Israel Fund and human rights organization had betrayed their country. Simultaneously, NGO Monitor targeted policymakers, embassies, international newspapers, donors, and other groups. Between October 2009 and May 2011, the new conservative watch group published 16 briefs, 11 opinion articles in newspapers like the Wall Street Journal, Haaretz, the Jerusalem Post, sent representatives to several television and radio talk shows, and issued 12 press releases about Goldstone's report and its reliance on evidence provided by the New York Organization. The campaign culminated in the publication of a 325-page anthology called The Goldstone Report Reconsidered, which featured chapters by former Israeli ambassador to the UN, Lori Gold, and Harvard University professor Alan Dershowitz. In this volume, Gerald Steinberg frames the UN report as an existential threat to Israel, arguing that the exploitation of moral and legal frameworks was seen as a major threat to the existence of Israel as the nation state of the Jewish now, campaigns launched by civil societies or organizations aim to shape public opinion so as to put pressure on policymakers and legislators. In this particular case, however, the policymakers and legislators were already in sync with the neoconservative NGOs and think tanks. Within two days of its publication, the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs responded, claiming that the Goldstone Report ties the hand of democratic countries fighting terror worldwide. It promotes criminal proceedings against forces confronting terrorism in foreign states and tries to expand the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court beyond its stature. Three months later, Israel's Deputy Foreign Minister, Daniel Yalom, used the lawfare metaphor to describe the situation claiming that today the trenches are in Geneva in the Council of Human Rights, or in New York in the General Assembly, or in the Security Council, or in The Hague, the International Criminal Court of Justice. Ayalon's boss, Foreign Minister of Victor Lieberman, proposed creating committees of inquiry to investigate human rights groups that delegitimize Israel and affect terror, and I quote, especially those that helped the Goldstone Committee investigating the 2008 incursion into Gaza. While Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu ultimately did not support this initiative, the reports, policy briefs, press releases, and official statements rapidly coalesced into a government doctrine about lawfare and how it constitutes a national security threat. By November 2010, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs published a long report entitled The Campaign to Defame Israel, where it asserted that the strategy to delegitimize Israel using legal frameworks and exploiting both international and national legal forums was adopted following numerous failed military attempts to destroy the Jewish state. It must be recognized that just the German military Theorist Karl von Clausewitz states that war is a continuation of political activity by other means. So too, lawfare is a continuation of terrorist activity 
by a little bit there. The logic is straightforward. Lawfare is a form of terrorism. Human rights NGOs are lawfare enablers, hence human rights NGOs are part of the terrorism network. The legislator did not hesitate to draw this connection either. In January 2011, the Knesset voted overwhelmingly, 41 to 16, in favor of establishing a panel of inquiry to probe funding sources of rights groups accused of delegitimizing the Israeli military. M.K. Fania Kishenbrand from Israel Beitenio, who submitted the proposal, accused human rights organizations of being behind the, incite, the indictments lodged against Israeli officers and officials around the world. The proposal to create a panel of inquiry was, however, just part of a larger legislative effort to regulate the production and dissemination of NGO knowledge. Over the past three years, Israeli legislators have introduced a state of 30 anti-democratic bills that have either been approved or are still being discussed in subcommittees in the Knesset. And while only one touches directly on human rights organizations, many of them aim to limit the freedom of expression. Examining public opinion polls reveals that there have been an identifiable and pronounced shift in the attitude towards human rights organizations over the past decade. In September 2003, in a September 2003 poll taken in the midst of the Second Intifada, when Israeli human rights NGOs were criticizing government policies and practices in the occupied territories, 57% of Israeli Jews still considered Israeli human rights organizations in a favorable way, while only 13% considered the local rights groups unfavorable. By May 2011, the percentage of those who considered Israeli human rights organizations in a favorable way had decreased by 16% to less than half of the population, while the percentage of people who considered rights NGOs unfavorably had more than doubled, reaching 31%. The 2003 and 2011 polls examined the attitudes of Israeli Jews towards Israeli human rights organizations in general. But the 2011 poll also isolated the attitude towards Israeli rights organizations which focus on Palestinian rights. The findings revealed that only 21% of Israeli Jews have a favorable attitude towards <coughs> Israeli human rights organizations focusing on Palestinian rights, about half the number of people with a favorable attitude towards the overall population of Israeli NGOs. And the unfavorable attitude towards these organizations is 53%. These public perceptions will likely only encourage Israeli policymakers and legislators to continue their assault on rights organizations. Moreover, in this atmosphere, it is difficult to see how human rights NGOs can have an impact on changing policy. In my paper, I go on to show how not long after the campaign was launched, the New Israel Fund, the single largest donor to human rights organization in Israel, changed its funding guidelines and stopped channeling donations to two organizations it had worked in with in the past. I discussed the New Israel's Fund new guidelines that NGOs must support the Jewish character of the State of Israel and the New Israel Fund's policy decision not to support NGOs that use universal jurisdiction outside Israeli territory. For lack of time, I will skip this part and turn to the conclusion, which is a bit long. <laughs> What were the two organizations that they stopped funding us, please? Um, let me conclude and then... The assault on human rights organization in Israel is actually only part of a more ambitious attack against international law writ large. In my paper, I show how the initial goal of those spearheading the campaign was to alter international law itself. The inability to actually change black letter law has led to the interpretation of international law in a way that is favorable to the so-called war on terrorism 
and the adoption of other strategies aimed at hampering the use of international law. The major guy in the U.S. was probably uh, Professor John Yu, uh, Yu, I think his name, from Berkeley, who was uh, uh, working under the Bush administration. In order to undermine universal jurisdiction, domestic laws that enable local courts to use international humanitarian and human rights laws to persecute foreign nationals have to be changed. One of the strategies, then, is to limit the exercise of universal jurisdiction in national courts. And this has been happening in countries like Belgium, Spain, the United Kingdom, primarily due to pressure coming from the United States. Second, it is crucial to limit the flow of information reaching these courts. I understand basically human rights organizations as organizations responsible for producing, or one of their roles is to produce information and disseminate it. So they're, they're responsible for producing a new kind of information and for channeling it abroad and in the country where they work. Accordingly, it is important to hinder the work of human rights organizations that produce and disseminate evidence about alleged war crimes perpetrated by military personnel and government officials. It is this strategy that I've tried to, that I focused on here. By way of conclusion, I would like to draw your attention to the fact that the assault against human rights organizations is informed by Edmund Burke's famous claim when he was writing about the French Revolution. And he said, there's no such thing as the rights, the abstract rights of men. There's only the rights of the Englishmen. <laughs> For those leading the campaign in Israel, the nation proceeds and trumps the human, and therefore the rights of the nation subject must be protected even at the expense of human rights. And, and so, Burke in many ways was right, and we can discuss that in the QA. The effort to determine who is the subject of human rights and to define it in wonderful <laughs> <laughs> I never have it on. That's the trouble. No problem. I do apologize. People will shut up. No. The effort to determine who is the subject of human rights and to define it in a very narrow way is, I believe, also pertinent to the effort to securitize human rights. Since all forms of securitization are dependent on a rivalry between friend and enemy, the human rights discourse must be framed within a binary logic. Accordingly, the abstract and universal human becomes the other. Which is used in the which is used by neoconservative NGOs and the government as a constitutive outside that helps shape and demarcate the national we, which is the subject of human rights. Insofar as Israeli human rights organizations support a universal notion of human rights, then they are aiding the other, the enemy. In this particular case, however, the we plays an additional role since it also undermines and indeed contradicts the universal potential in forming the field of human rights. This is one of the reasons why the assault on human rights organizations is extremely dangerous. It denies and aims to undo the very conception of human rights that evolved following the horrors of World War II and was eloquently stated in the preamble of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family. The very notion of a so-called human family whose members all have dignity and inalienable rights is antithetical to the conception of human rights derived from the ethno-national identity as well as to the construction of the we versus them that is needed for the securitization process. Thus, the danger of the securitization is that it aims to limit the work of human rights organization through the restriction of the discourse and activities that they deploy. According now, and I want to show, by a really the way of conclusion, how this works. So what happened? After all this attack and what's going on in Israel, 
these rate organizations figure and they, and they it's their public opinion polls. So they know what the situation, their situation in the Israeli public is. And they understand that they caught they're not really influencing public opinion. And so what they did is they 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 hired this external research group and they did focus group uh, uh, meetings where nine human rights, the nine major human rights organizations met and discussed how they can change their reputation among the Israeli public in order to have a better influence. And they, this focus group also did questionnaires, public opinions, and so forth, not important for us here. I, I want to end by two examples. What The two examples are press releases. They're not real. They're what happens at the focus group. One is a press release that they say this is the kind of press release we used to send out to the newspapers about something in Gaza. You'll see it in a second. And a second is a press release that they're thinking of second sending out in order to kind of deflect the criticism against them. So let's look at these two press releases. This is the kind of press release many human rights would use before. Israel's prohibition on transferring goods from Gaza to the West Bank is an illegal practice designed to punish the Palestinian residents of Gaza and to cut them off from their brethren in the West Bank under the guise of false security claims and the misleading notion that Gaza is no longer occupied. And the second press release is, and this is the one they think may be a good idea to use, the policy that permits the transfer of goods from Gaza via Israel to Europe, but not to the West Bank, prevents the fulfillment of the Strip's productive potential and is contrary to both government decisions and the declarations of the security establishment on the need to enable economic development for Gaza's residents. The government must refrain from imposing restrictions on movements that are not necessary for maintaining security, which disproportionately harm the civil population or prevent Gaza residents from living a normal life. Now, much can be said about the difference between these two statements, not least about the efforts to depoliticize and universalize the rights discourse. I, however, want to focus on the way Israel's security concerns are presented in the first press release as false and therefore should not come in the way of human rights, while in the second one, human rights are presented as legitimate and something that should be actualized only so long as they are not in conflict with Israel's necessary security concerns. In other words, the way for Israel's rights organizations to be legitimized in the eyes of Israeli public <coughs> is to agree with the subordination of human rights to Israel's security agenda. Whether Israeli rights practitioners actually end up adopting this new discourse is unclear, but if they do, then the securitization process will have achieved its goal. Thank you very much. Vis-a-vis um, -vis Israeli issues, uh, which society do you find more fascist in Israel or American Jewry? More what? Um, argumentative or split in different groups with different ideas. I mean, in, in Israel, it, there's many different groups thinking differently about different things, and now that you've been in the United States, how do you react to all the factions here about Israel? There are almost I think, I think what has happened in the United States over the past few years is that the discourse here has broadened. It used to be said that in Israel you could say you could be much more critical of Israel than you could ever be in the United States. And I and as a person that comes here to speak, and has come here to speak for many years. I know that for many years that was true. Things that I would say in Israel that were written in the Haaretz and in other papers in Israel 
were not were illegitimate in the United States. And I think we're seeing a process that's changing in this direction. The discourse in the United States is opening it. You, you can see it not only through J Street, which is a, a counter in APAC, but I think Jewish Voices for Peace has a following of 150,000 Jews. That's not a small amount for a social, for kind of a grassroots kind of uh, movement. So Jewish Voices for Peace, are, uh, and, and Jewish Voices for Peace are on the extreme left, even according to, or not extreme, are on the left, according to Israeli politics and so forth. At the same time, so as we see this broadening of discourse in, in this broadening of the debate where the New York Times even publishes articles about the one state solution and so forth in the US, we see a kind of stifling of debate in Israel and these anti-democratic laws, which many of them have to do with kind of uh, um, limiting freedom of expression. And so now there's different laws limiting uh, let's say, commemoration of the Nakba in public institutions, there's the BDS law, and so forth. And so I think the debate in Israel is kind of contracting at the same time as the debate in the, uh, in the United States is opening up. Yes? Following up on, on what you just said, the press releases, and also the biographs about the changes in public opinion in Israel, um, seem to be describing bigger shifts than necessarily just how people view the NGOs. Um, you know, given um, what's happening in Israel in terms of public discourse, and um, I, I, do you think that you know having a press release like this, as opposed to the other kind of press release, you know, would really gain more acceptance um, of the NGOs? I appreciate your point that. You know, this one subjects human rights to less absolute security movements and so forth. But um, in a sense, there's a problem with the first press release too, in that it spoke, if I remember correctly, of the intent behind design to punish the Palestinian residents of Gaza. I mean, that's a little bit problematic too, because were they designed something else? Would that make it okay? I mean, it doesn't really matter in a sense what, what the intention is. So I'm sorry, I'm really, I'm just I think you have two questions and I want to answer both of them. One question is about kind of the, there's a more general phenomenon going on behind what my paper is. And I think you're absolutely right. And I think if we look at the attack today in Israel it is it it has four problems or four top major targets. One of them is the human rights organizations. The other one is the media. And the last one is the academia, the, the, the universities. And why? Those are the first three. I'll get to the fourth in a moment. These three are all responsible for production of knowledge in different ways, OK, and for the flow of knowledge. And the last one, the last target, is the Supreme Court, the High Court of Justice. And the idea is, is, is that when the High Court of Justice, which has had has an abominable record regarding the occupied territories, but has an excellent record regarding people like me, Ashkenazi Jews, okay, men. So it it, 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 it is it is the last safeguard, or it is a safeguard of Israeli democracy, at least for the Jews or for the citizens of Israel. And that's the gem on the crown that they are after, OK? And one of the reasons I think that, they're, that, that, that we see this spate of anti-democratic laws is a, it's a way to attack the court. Because then the court, the, the, the human rights organizations will bring these laws to the court, which they are doing. And if the court annuls se several of them, then the legislator can say, "This we are the representatives of the people. The court is going against the representatives of the people. We need to change the way the court is constituted in the way it works. So that's the background of this paper. 
Now, regarding your question about which press release and what should the human rights organizations do, the way I have come to understand it over the years is that there's many human rights organizations. And these human rights organizations should have different roles. And there should be organizations that are closer to the establishment and that can try to influence the establishment for being close to them in what Bourdieu would call social space. And then there should be organizations that one could call more radical, and that they should you know, stand by their principles and do exactly without bending an inch. And the dynamic, and that is healthy, I think, in a society, because that creates also a dynamic between the human rights organization that they kind of pull each other in different directions, and they have different social roles uh, uh, to do. Whether, the, and finally, the last aspect of your question, whether these human rights organizations, whether the Israeli public will start to like them, I doubt it like everything. Yes. Oh, thank you very much. It's very courageous and very thoughtful of what you've done. Uh, I, I say this because it, as I look around the world, and having traveled extensively, it, it's apparent that the, all human rights are under attack throughout the world with corporate money and political money. And I'm concerned about this because uh, you're a visitor here, but those of us who work with, you know, the First Amendment and other things, I know we've lost our in Chicago, we're concerned that we're seeing these same erosions here. And I was very pleased you talked about that jewel in the crown that this group is after in Israel. Because the same thing is happening here, where those who speak out are becoming criminalized. And I, I, that's the only term I can think of at this point, that more and more are becoming criminalized, or as I said to you before the speech, Richard Paul, just speaking about the thing that America should be careful of, was attacked for telling the truth, and Susan Rice, who's detested in so much of Africa and the Middle East and Asia, is speaking out and saying, you should shut his mouth, he doesn't know what he's talking about. And I think what I'm concerned about then is that is the criminalization of people like Paul and others, and what we're facing here as well as there, and not just in Israel and America, but around the world. And how do you see things developing? Because it's very courageous, and I commend you for what you have to say. And your careful analysis uh, is excruciatingly painful, but helpful. I think. Ultimately, people like me are extremely privileged. And so, yes, there are these processes that are happening, but, uh, um, but ultimately, both Professor Fogg and myself were privileged, and really so they can criticize it and so forth. But I think we're, at this moment, at least in history, there's no substantial threat, uh, particularly here. In Israel, I think it might be changing. We don't know yet. And we have to be vigilant, and we just have to continue what we're doing. That's, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's all. Now, this is not, now, my situation is very different from uh, Palestinian friends that live in the same neighborhood. Okay, so it's, we have to see. I, as an ethnic Jew, uh, I have certain privileges in Israel that Palestinians do not have. Um, yes. Uh, so, you described the, the change over the past 10 years in the attitude, uh, maybe public opinion attitude to the human rights organization because of a brilliant public opinion attack by certain neoconservative groups. But this is not the real problem. I mean, this is free speech and they can do what they like. The real problem is that this is translated to, let's say, anti-democratic laws by Israeli government. So I'm wondering if this is a consequence of uh, this just brilliant attack or it's really a consequence 
of another thing that happened in the last decade in Israel, after the second intifada, we all know that uh, this was a shock, a devastating shock to the Israeli left. And the parliament, the government, were just right wing, and people like Lieberman occupy and generate such, uh, you know, may generate such uh, uh, laws by themselves. So, it is really the, uh, you know, this brilliant attack or much more global thing that happened in the Israeli politics that made uh, the situation so bad, both for these human rights organizations and for yeah, other things. I think the argument would be that you cannot make that distinction. The reason Lieberman and we have and the, the configuration of the Knesset is determined by the public that have these opinions. So, and then they can feed each other, right? The Knesset can feed the public and the far public feeds the Knesset. And so what I was trying to show is that there's actually a kind of reproduction process of these different forces in society from either from and it's a reproduction process of different forces in society and what we really see here is is a, a textbook struggle in democracy organizations of civil society trying to influence the public in order to pressure the legislator to legislate new laws I, I, I just yeah I agree I just wonder if if Kim Tin Tir Su and this NGO paper in Bali Land didn't exist, wouldn't we see the same thing? That's a counterfactual, right? So uh, I, my, my, I don't know. I can't. Uh, I don't know. Um, yes. Um, this is a kind of narrow question, but I wonder if you could talk a little bit about Gerald Steinberg. I mean, I heard a couple of years ago that he had been in. I, I didn't mean personally. I, I didn't mean. I, I just mean. I, I heard a couple of years ago. I think it was from Joel McDowell, who had been at the Israel Studies Association meeting in Toronto, and Steinberg, who's the founder of this NGO Monitor, uh, had given a talk, very, very much along, you know, making the points that you're challenging here, and was not well received. And I, I, I'm wondering, you know, if his connections, his money, who, who, who's behind this operation? Well, what we see, and so I think, yeah, I, I want to connect the two questions because I think it's not coincidental that we have these organizations and that they have power because they, they have the Intitsu as direct had to the former Minister of Education direct access, and they were working on the attack on the Israeli academia. NGO Monitor has, again, direct access to the corridors of government. And in a way, I would say the whole atmosphere is what created these organizations. They did not come out of a void. So yes, there is. It would be interesting to do a study of these kind of networks, to kind of map the different people and, and their connections here. And, and so forth. And they are connected to Campus Watch and to Daniel Pike and Native Intelligence. And it's all connected. Now, it, it works both ways. You have to, to, to at least put it on the table. Also, the traditional human rights organizations and and certain Knesset members and certain civil societies and academics are also connected. This is how these things work in, 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 in politics. There are these networks. So there is in different donors. You can see that if you look at the money, money's always interesting. I'm interested in money. So if you look at the, the money is about this whole thing, it's, it's fascinating because first of all, everyone wins. Everyone wins from this situation. NGO Monitor is richer, and Bitsenim is richer, and, and, and the New Israel Fund is richer. Everyone is richer from this attack. This, this rivalry brings donors on all sides. We feel we have to protect these organizations, and they feel, okay, so that's an interesting thing. But the donors are a bit different. Whereas the human rights organizations receive donors from Jewish Americans, but they also receive 
donors from Christian churches and from the Ford Foundation and from the EU and things like that. NGO Monitor and Initiative 2 receive donations only from Jewish Americans and Jewish Europeans. So they, they're, they're, so that's one aspect of it. Uh, and they're connected and they build networks and so forth. I don't know if I'm answering that, but that's oh, the best thing. The money thing oh. and the, yeah. One more question. Uh, <laughs> yeah, take two together, okay? This is just a yeah. short response. I, I thought that one of the founders of one of the major donors of things of two was Haiti. Was Christian. At one point, Christian. but then the he beginning. took away the money. Yeah, but Even he took away the yeah, money. Yeah, but in the beginning. <laughs> yes, you're right. But that, but then he took. So that's a, that's a mistake on my part. So they did receive money from Christian evangelists. Okay, that basically a, a certain kind of Christian evangelists that are hyper Zionists and, and that have I mean but they have this whole notion of what will happen in the future, the Jews will be part of it. Okay, so it's a student of the matter. But yes. Um, thank you. I, I just wanted to ask a clarifying question. Um, you talk about the idea of um, anti, sort of anti-NGO attitudes, sort of anti-human rights and NGO attitudes in America, but then another phrase that's being thrown around is sort of anti-democratic laws. And I don't think, I was curious how, what the relationship between these two concepts is, like, are you equating them? Like, well, I would be very critical of trying to put them together. I did maybe do it, uh, but I don't think they're the same. Um, but what, there are many of these laws, do, the laws are basically targeting two central issues. One is freedom of expression, and the other is equality, okay? Which are foundational principles, or probably the two pillars of democracy in many ways. And they are also basic to human rights. So in that sense, they are uh, they are connected, but I don't want, I, I agree with your kind of um, at least subtle criticism, and I think you're right, they're not the same. I would only say that, we, maybe with this conclude, that recently I had a discussion with Hassan Jabari. Hassan Jabari is a lawyer, and he's the founder and director of Adala, a major uh, human rights organization in Israel, that deals with uh, uh, the Palestinian citizens of Israel. And he was, he, the, the, one of the things that Dalla is doing is actually seeing the, whether these new laws will stand in the Supreme Court. And the day before I talked to him, he appeared on a case of, um, of commit, a community committee where there's a certain kind of settlement inside Israel that creates a committee to decide who can live there and who cannot. And this can be used, of course, against Palestinians, but it can also be used against gays, it can also be used against single mothers, anything you want. And at the same time, he's also at the court regarding the BDS law, the boycott, divestment, and, 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 and uh, sanctions law. And there's this law that says you cannot support the U.S. And I asked him, okay, so what's going to happen with these laws? And he said, we're going to lose on the community law. This is what he guesses. He doesn't know. We're going to lose on the community law and win on the BDS law. So I asked him why. He says, because the community law deals with equality and the BDS law deals with freedom of expression. And the court will rule for freedom of expression but against the problem. Okay, now, this is prediction. It might not be the case. Uh, it wasn't the case with the Nakba law, which is a matter of freedom of expression, and it was struck down, and the law remains. I mean, the appeal was struck down, and the law remains. So, 
but I thought maybe I'll just leave it at that. So thank you very much.